as it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's event. I'm Dr. Laura Miller. I'm the Eiji uh, Shibusawa Seigo Arai Endowed Professor of Japanese Studies and Professor of History at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Um, the professorship and UMSL Global are sponsoring the event today, which has three segments. An examination of the Yamamba by Dr. Rebecca Copeland an interview with Dr. Copeland, and then a short question and answer time. Before I introduce our main guest, let me mention that the interviewer is Katie Stevens, a graduate student at Washington University who is working on a PhD in Japanese literature. Uh, Katie is currently writing her dissertation on the Japanese horror genre. <laughs> our special guest, Dr. Copeland, is a professor of Japanese literature in the Department of East Asian Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She is considered one of the most prolific and most accomplished scholars of the literature and the culture of Japan. She's the author of uh, exciting and groundbreaking books, including The Sound of the Wind, mm -hmm. The Life and Works of Uno Chio. Um, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 1992. And my favorite, Lost Leaves, Women Writers of Meiji Japan, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 2000. She has edited or co-edited four other books, The Modern Murasaki, Writing by Women of Meiji Japan, published by Columbia University Press in 2006. Women Critiqued, Translated Essays on Japanese Women's Writing, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 2006, and The Father-Daughter Plot, mm -hmm. Japanese Literary Women and the Law of the Father, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 2001. The most recent of her <laughs> co-edited books is this one, um, Diva Nation, Female Icons from Japanese Cultural History, published by the University of California Press in 2018. Dr. Copeland currently has two books coming out any day now. <laughs> <laughs> One is The Kimono Tattoo, published by Brother Mockingbird. It's her debut work of fiction, taking readers on a journey into the world, a world of mystery and kimono design. The other book is uh, the innovative, and I should say discipline smashing, <laughs> uh, co-edited book she will discuss today, Yamamba, In Search of the Japanese Mountain Witch. And this is published by Stonebridge Press. So it is therefore my great privilege and pleasure uh, to present one of the best writers and scholars in Japan studies today, Dr. Copeland. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. That was beyond generous. And um, I, I'd like to, I'd like to I have a share screen. So I'd like to go ahead and um, share some images. Um, I'll be talking about um, this book, Yamamba in Search of the Japanese Mountain, which, and it's, it's really a, um, a delight to have this opportunity to talk about something that I've enjoyed working on so much. And I've worked on this book with Linda Ehrlich, who is a uh, independent scholar and expert in Japanese uh, cinema and film, as well as theater. And she is a uh, translate, I mean, a, a poet as well. Um, the book Yamamba, I love the way Dr. Miller described it as, is um, uh, uh, genre smashing, a uh, discipline smashing. Uh, it is a, a strange collection, I guess, an amalgam of uh, academic and creative writing. Um, and I'll, I, I will talk, obviously, I'm going to talk about that more. But right now, I'd like to just go over what the Yamamba is. I think probably most of you in the audience, who I can't even see, um, know what a Yamamba is, but I'm still, I'm going to go over this in case there are those who are not quite sure. So the Yamamba is a, a female demon 
And um, the name Yamamba is romanized in um, English as Yamamba or uh, Yamanba. Um, and both of those romanizations come from the same uh, kanji, Yamamba. Um, sometimes this is all, she's also described as Yamauba. And in, in all cases, it refers to a, um, uh, the mountain witch or crone or hag. In our book, we decided to go with the, the romanization Yamamba, which is in fact older. Um, the, the romanization with the in is the preferred romanization now. That is the standard romanization now. But when Linda and I encountered the Yamamba years ago for the first time, we were more familiar with the um, romanization with the M. So that's where we're going. The, um, what is constant about the Yamamba is the, the, the mountain. Um, the topos of the mountains, Yama from Yamamba means mountain. And uh, much of, of the characteristic of Yamamba comes from her connection to a mountainous realm. Um, in Japan, as in other countries, mountains can be foreboding places, severe, dangerous places with precipices and drop-offs and all kinds of, of scary things. Um, wild animals and so forth. And so this uh, association with the mountains creates the sense of the uncanny and the eerie about the Yamamba. The mountains are also associated with um, spirituality. However, many um, famous temples and shrines are built high atop mountains or deep within mountain recesses. And also graveyards tend to be um, uh, built upon mountainsides. And so there's also an association of mountains with liminality, with um, um, access to a spiritual world, a, a, a borderland that um, provides a gateway into the world beyond. Uh, and this is also an important aspect of the mountains and of the um, woman who lives there. Um, the mountains are frequently a site of, um, of pilgrimages, of Buddhist austerities, again, with the severe landscape and the, the sense of, of um, spiritual closeness in the mountains. Uh, it is an important site for a number of different kinds of, of Buddhist austerities. But the um, um, Yamamba is uh, often treated as being an outcast from the, the village. So there is in the mountains a distinction between the wild of the mountains, the unclaimed um, regions of the mountain, and the civilized, settled region of the, the village or the sato. And the, the village represents stability, security, order. And of course, with order comes laws and rules and um, uh, safety, but also perhaps prohibition. So the, the mountain in contrast suggests uh, freedom, um, rebelliousness, and um, um, a, a world that is untamed. And so that is the world of the Yamamba. Um, there were people that traveled through the mountains who weren't Yamamba. There were all kinds of people from the um, medieval period on Japanese population grew and um, people were pushed further and further into mountains. There were merchants who traveled across mountains and um, others and also itinerant performers. So we encounter um, women who traveled through the mountains to get from one performance site to another. Shirabiyoshi were dancers who were affiliated with the court or with um, esteemed uh, aristocratic palaces, the daimyo, the shogun, and so forth. And Miko were shrine maidens who were 
often affiliated with particular shrines or were not affiliated with any particular shrine and traveled across the lands to um, uh, go from shrine to shrine. So these women, and this, these are just two examples of female entertainers, these women were not associated with particular families. They were um, um, freed <laughs> of family obligation and family protection. And as a result, were often considered immoral and um, uh, loose. I think Barbara Roosh, the very famous uh, historian of medieval Japanese history has described these women, regardless of, of the distinction of their um, um, position were regarded as um, prostitutes because they weren't under the protection of a particular family. And in addition to these itinerants, you had uh, men who were medicine peddlers or mountain priests, or even the mythical legendary Tengu would be associated with the mountains. So women were frequently described as Yamamba and um, men as Tengu. They were both fearsome um, and both were also uh, a complex characters. So the Yamamba, uh, has a very monstrous kind of persona. She is frequently described as being insatiable, having a, a ravenous appetite. There's a, a well-known legend um, relating to the, the image you see here on the right of a woman who uh, presents as being very demure, um, a, a, hus a man wanted a wife who did not eat because he thought he would, he would save a lot of money if he didn't have to feed her. So um, he suddenly finds this beautiful woman who comes to his house and, and marries him and she doesn't eat. And he just thinks he's the luckiest man in the world until one day he, he, dis he, he discovers her at night just gorging through a mouth on the back of her head, a hidden mouth. And that's when he realizes she's a Yamamba. Um, the other image just shows the, the monstrous nature of the Yamamba. She was often thought to be a cannibal, to devour babies or eat the hapless men who happened upon her um, mountain abode. On the other hand, Yamamba, <laughs> are thought to also have a nurturing persona. Um, Dr. Noriko Reeder, who is one of the contributors to our volume, describes these different conflicting characteristics of the Yamamba in her introduction. And she describes one legend that has the Yamamba giving birth to 7,800 infants at once. So she doesn't just eat people, she also reproduces people. Um, and there, so there's a maternal nature about Yamamba. There is also an association of the Yamamba with the divine. And um, um, some stories about the Yamamba depict her as being very um, ben benevolent, helping peasants, helping weavers and so forth. Um, probably the first use of the word Yamamba or the, the first depiction of the Yamamba on stage certainly was by the famous no play, no playwright Zayami. And in this play, he describes a itinerant dancer, perhaps like a, the Shirabiyoshi who travels from Kyoto, the capital, uh, to a temple and on her way, she has to cross over a vast foreboding mountainscape. This dancer is famous for her portrayal of the Yamamba. And um, lo and behold, when she is in the, the darkest recesses of the mountain, she suddenly encounters the real Yamamba. And uh, the, the no play is about their uh, encounter. The Yamamba is, this Yamamba is more an image of, of the power of nature and is not represented as a cannibal. 
the, the complex image of the Yamamba is one that has enthralled 20th century and 21st century um, Japanese women artists. And that's one of the reasons that we um, were so interested in uh, creating this book as a further example of the impact the Yamamba has had on the creative arts. So Oba Minako was a very well-known novelist who has a number of stories that either position the um, retelling her story from a modern perspective or um, um, chant the um, in a subversive and powerful way in her literature. So we have one of Oba Minako's stories, The Smile of a Mountain Witch, uh, reprinted in our collection. The, the story was originally translated by Noriko Mizuta um, in the 1980s. And so it's, this is a reprint of that translation. Yokoshi Yasuko is a, a contemporary dancer and choreographer. And she very recently choreographed a, um, a dance that was derived from the Yamamba and also the No Play by Zayami. And it's an incredibly imaginative and wondrous dance in which, again, she channels the, the power, the awesomeness and the creativity of the Yamamba image. So we have a uh, interview with Yasuko Yokoshi in our volume, as well as interviews with uh, two performers of no drama who have performed in the Yamamba role. And finally, Yamamba has uh, had an influence on uh, young women, at least in the um, 19, late 1990s and early 2000s, the, the well-known Gangoro street fashion style uh, seems to have also um, channeled a bit of Yamamba's irreverent energy. So this is the, the um, table of contents for the, the volume. I know this is kind of hard. It's probably too small to read, but um, hopefully this has given you an overview of the book and I will uh, stop the share now. And I'm just really delighted to have uh, Katie <laughs> sharing the screen with me and um, look forward to your questions. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you for your introduction to the Yamamba. I'm sure that that is uh, very uh, informative for everyone and maybe a reminder for some of us who have forgotten or is, you know, an introduction to uh, such an en enigmatic character. Um, so my first question um, that I'd like to ask is, how did you get the idea for the book? Oh, OK. Um, OK, it's a long story. All right, but it, 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 it goes back to Dr. Miller. And I don't know if she's aware of this or not, but um, a number of years ago, well, um, first of all, I, I'm gonna have to show you another, I'm gonna have to show you another um, picture here. Um, you may not be aware of it, but Dr. Miller not only is a very um, um, prolific scholar, but she's an artist. And um, she's well known for creating these artworks um, that perhaps are, are like um, retablo, or she calls them spirit boxes. And they're often whimsical collages of um, whatever she has on her mind. So in this case, this box is on tarot cards and the sort of the occult. Uh, Dr. Miller works, is working on a book on this. She has another example, um, Abe no Seime, a cute little box that uh, channels that, all of that energy. And um, this, she made a box for the, the book that she and I co-edited together, uh, Divination. She held up the, the, um, the book earlier. So Dr. Miller, makes these uh, boxes in on um, cold winter afternoons, she would invite me over to her art studio. And um, it usually, you know, in between semesters, you, you're in sort of a doldrum, it's um, you're, you're 
sapped of energy. It's gray, it's cold, it's St. Louis. And so we would put together art boxes and it was one way of rejuvenating our energy and having fun, but also being creative. And one afternoon I had come to her art studio with the plan to create a certain box. I was making a box for my sister and um, I finished early my box. And uh, Dr. Miller said, well, make another one. And I said, well, I don't know what to make. I, I didn't bring anything. I don't have any plans and, and kind of whining. And she said, just make a box. Look, I have all this stuff. And she opened these drawers and had buttons and baubles and all kinds of things. And one thing she pulled out was a, a um, calendar, an old calendar with an image of a mountain. And when I saw that, I said, I'm going to make you a mamba. I'm going to make a Yamamba box. And so I did. And um, turned out this is what it, it turned out to look at like. And I just thought it was so much fun. I loved it. Um, I wasn't planning to make it. It just came to me as an inspiration that rarely happens. So that was sort of exciting. So I put it on Facebook because right, that's what you do. And um, immediately Linda Ehrlich, who was on Facebook, um, told me that she was working on a a uh, chapbook. She was working on a, a poem, a long form poem uh, devoted to the Yamamba derived from Zayami's No Play. And would I contribute a photograph of this beautiful work of art um, for her, her book? And I just, I couldn't get a good picture. I couldn't get not good. So I declined. And then a little while later, we we continued to communicate and I said, Linda, why don't we be more ambitious? Why don't we create a book and include artwork and your poem and other creative um, works? And um, we also include a, a new uh, spirit box by um, Dr. Miller, which she then explicates in the volume. So it's a, a creative work that is then described in an essay in our volume. And so that's a rather long way of answering your question, but it was a spontaneous event that just sort of everything came together. And when Linda and I decided that we would work on a, a more ambitious project and include different examples of the way the Yamamba, Yamamba inspires art, um, I had already, I had just met the dancer uh, uh, Yokoshi Yasuko and we decided to interview her for the piece. And it, it just, everything just miraculously kind of came together. Is it that the Yamamba was guiding us? Could be in one of her uh, benevolent moments, but yeah. So that's a long way of telling you how the, it sort of, happened. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, the, the dancer and some of the other um, creators that you wanted to ask to join the book. Um, how did you find the other um, artists and writers uh, and scholars that you included? Yeah, so we know we knew we needed to have a proper introduction to the Yamamba in the, I mean, this, this, um, project is intended for a wide audience and not just Japanese scholars. And we, we hope that it will reach a, a broad audience. So we knew we needed to have a general, inter, general introduction. And that uh, led me to Noriko Reader. She is, um, I mean, she, she knows everything about folklore and um, uh, has written uh, many, many works on not on, on Yamamba, but on other um, yokai and um, so forth. And, and um, in fact, she has a book coming out in June exclusively on Yamamba. So we, we knew we had to ask her to write our introduction. And then um, it's sort of word of mouth. It was, I wanted to find academics who were also working creatively. And I, I didn't know as, I didn't know that many. I know there are a lot out there. And so I just went with the people I knew. <laughs> Great. Um, so with all these uh, different people contributing, um, how long did it take to, from the start of when you conceived of the book to the, its completion? 
So, um, let's see. I think the ex the the artwork, the 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 um, spirit box with with Dr. Miller, that was in early 2018, and um, so then Linda and I met in, over Facebook and began to plan. And I think we began um, seriously collecting things in 2019. So by December, 2019, we had almost all of the chapters. There are nine chapters, including a preface. And by December of 2019, is that right? We had almost everything. And um, then, um, by May of 2020, we had the complete um, draft to send to Stonebridge Press. In that, I think in July of 2019, Linda um, got the contract for us with Stonebridge Press. And then we um, submitted everything by May of 2020. And, you know, production takes a little while. By November of 2020, we had the... Um, proofs from the press and then working on the proofs and now it's ready to be released. I, I'm, I'm a little, I have heard that the release date was, which was scheduled for May has of uh, this year has been um, uh, changed to June because the printers are backed up apparently. <laughs> So um, to switch gears kind of like the, to the more broad idea of the Yamamba, um, as I'm sure you are very well aware, uh, Japan has no shortage of fascinating mythical creatures and yokai. So <laughs> why did you decide to focus on specifically Yamamba? Oh, okay. Um, good question. I think it's, I don't know that we decided as much as the Yamamba decided. I feel like we were all kind of, already working but in, in, in that direction. And um, the Yamamba kind of pulled us together. Like I said, Yasuko Yokoshi, the dancer, was completing her, her work and she contacted me. And, um, uh, and, you know, Linda was completing her poem and I was already interested in Yamamba. But I think there's something about the Yamamba that has a particular appeal to um, creative women. And of course, in the 19, from the 1970s, Japanese women writers have begun to, to channel the Yamamba. Of all the other yokai, um, it's really the Yamamba that they have channeled into their works. I, I think, I feel like the Yamamba represents a, a sense of aberration and also power that is enthralling to women, creative women, female artists in Japan who have felt that through their creative voice, they often find themselves on the other side of social expectation. And, and in fact, identify with the sense of isolation that the Yamamba represents as she is pushed out into the mountain. Um, at the same time, they're drawn to the sense of freedom and um, power that the Yamamba also evinces <laughs> to over the mountaintops. So I think there, there's something about the Yamamba that's relatable to women working um, often in traditionally male spheres or women who stand outside the social structure of the family who dare to stand alone. To so I hope that answered your yeah. question. Thank you. Um, this, uh, my next question uh, kind of stems and is, is uh, connected to your concept of the um, kind of, you know, the, the being a, an inspiration for women, but also uh, maybe the kind of misogyny that Yamamba is, has been associated with. For mm -hmm. example, um, the, there's the, uh, the figure of the Senin, who is the uh, powerful and beneficial sage who also lives alone in the mountains like the Tengu or the Yamamba, but mm -hmm. 
in the case of the Senin and Tengu, these are male figures. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how the Yamamba has been perceived, perhaps in contrast to these other marginalized figures who oh. happen to be male. <laughs> Interesting, yes, <laughs> indeed. I think um, sending a, a, an immortal um, is typically someone who is beyond who who has achieved a level of enlightenment beyond human capacity. So uh, it's a very been a uh, sort of wondrous figure, not necessarily one who's scripted as malevolent. Um, and so men, such as these Buddhist priests who are going about their austerities, men in the mountains are frequently associated with uh, achieving higher enlightenment. So that this very um, wonderful kind of occupation, um, whereas the Yamamba is rooted in this world um, and in carnality, the, the sending is more beyond the body and the Yamamba is the body incarnate with all of her, her rages and her ravenousness. Um, and the Tengu has more similarity, I think, with the Yamamba in that te Tengu are also, also um, kind of mischievous and can be frightening. I mean, they can, they kidnap women. Um, they can, they can be dangerous creatures, but their name, Ten, they're associated with uh, divinity as well. And I think more recently, Tengu are associated with uh, a, a awesome power. Um, so I like, in, in that sense, they are similar to the Yamamba in that both of them have a, um, characteristics that are complex, both malevolent and benevolent. Thank you. Uh, in my own work, I, I read about different yokai and uh, it's really interesting to see the differences, especially along gender lines. So, Well, there are modern, that. you know, I guess there, <laughs> you know, there's modern yokai, female yokai that um, kind of have Yamamba principles, I guess, but are more recent, of more recent. Oh, yes. Like, uh, for example, uh, Kuchisake Onna. Oh, well, that's what, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that, that one's a very modern uh, example of a, a woman. It, it kind of connects to your, uh, the, the with the mouth uh, on yeah. the back of the head is, uh, yeah, her mouth is also monstrous. So, um, yeah, I could see a, a parallel there, perhaps. Women and appetites are always scary, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is more uh, just about the um, process of completing the book. So I was wondering what some of the challenges that you encountered during uh, the completion and public and leading up to the publication of your book. So uh, I feel it, it went pretty smoothly, really. Um, I actually feel it went pretty quickly. Um, it felt like it went quickly. I, I mean, I didn't think that um, Linda and I had to, to struggle, but, um, but I, one of the challenges is the fact that the Yamamba is so multifaceted and so complex. And um, anytime you try to reduce the Yamamba to one thing, then you've missed it. And I guess what we are going for um, in, in the book was to represent that multiplicity. So we have um, chapters that focus more on the frightfulness of the Yamamba. Some chapters focus on really the beauty of her power and others on her sort of uh, uh, whimsical mischievousness, um, her nurturing. <laughs> uh, so the, hopefully the book has captured the multifaceted nature of Yamamba, but there's the challenge is to avoid creating a one-dimensional um, reproduction of, of what we feel uh, the Yamamba is. <laughs> what about um, some of the surprises in addition to the challenges? Um, there's, yes, there are, there were, oh yes, there were many, <laughs> there are surprises. Um, for, I think 
One thing that really surprised me, first of all, Dr. Reader, Noriko Reader's chapter um, revealed that in the beginning, the Amamba was represented as an Oni. Um, and Oni are typically uh, sort of identified as male. They often just wear a little loincloth, for example, if, if they are described. Um, often they, I guess they are just uh, forces that you don't even see, but um, the Oni are typically presented as male. And according to Dr. Reeder, the Oni were able to shape shift and transform into a female guise. And so in the beginning, the Yamamba didn't have a particular uh, gender. Um, but Dr. Reeder notes that from a the medieval period, um, she, there is a she, she is uh, represented as female and thus the name Yamamba uh, emerges. And that then solidifies the Yamamba as a female figure. Of course, she's giving birth to 7,800 babies at once. So probably female, probably not human though. Um, and so that surprised me that in initially, Yamamba didn't have a, a, um, a set gender. And then in, in the interview that Anne Sheriff has with the two no performers, um, she asks them a really interesting question. She says, you know, like, how do you see the Yamamba appealing to um, 21st century audiences from a gendered perspective? And the, um, the, both of the actors respond by saying, I don't think of her as woman um, or onna. And um, another uh, of the actors says, you know, I, I, I don't see how the Yamamba fits a 21st century concept of, of gender. And and um, Sheriff pressed them a little bit. Um, well, what if a man, what if the role of the Yamamba in the no play was male? No, 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 that won't work. That would not be interesting. It has to be female. And one of the reasons that they offered for why it had to be female is that um, themes that are associated with the Yamamba in this no play are delusion and excessive attachment. And they suggest that in um, classical Japanese literature, you find it more compelling and um, complex if the characters burdened are female. Um, anyway, that's how, that's how they saw the Yamamba. They didn't first associate gender. And, and that surprised me because from what I've read from the, the modern women writers, gender was what was important, so. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Um, uh, will you write about Yamamba again in the future? Is this the, only, is this the end of Yamamba for you? <laughs> never, <laughs> never the end of Yamamba, right? I think the Yamamba is ever present. And um, I don't know, I don't know that, I, 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 know, I know I probably won't attempt another collection like this, but I doubt that I've seen the last of the Yamamba. I don't know if you know, but I'm moving, eventually I will move to a home in the mountains, the North Carolina mountains. And I suspect I will find Yamamba there. <laughs> um, I guess uh, my final is a, a final question is about um, your novel that you wrote. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, because you have two books coming out, so. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so it, it's called The Kimono Tattoo and it's set in, in 21st century Kyoto. Um, it doesn't feature a Yamamba <laughs> per se, but um, in, the, in the novel, the, um, the kimono does almost take on a, a personified role. So the kimono uh, um, is a um, object that, carries a certain power. Um, that's not really what the book's about though. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. A, um, a American woman living in Kyoto who is a translator is asked to, to translate a novel by a long forgotten Japanese writer who is kind of in the naturalist vein. And she begins translating his 
his the first chapter of his novel, thinking that it is based on his life since he is in the naturalist vein and um, suddenly encounters a, the, the, a scene with a corpse, a dead corpse that is tattooed like a kimono, um, with tattooed with kimono motifs. And the next day she hears on the news that a body was found um, in the exact same location, it, no mention of tattoos. So that's how the story begins. And the translator, our, our protagonist has to figure out if she has sort of witnessed a murder, um, if she has clues to a murder. And the further she goes to try to figure it out, the further she gets implicated in a pretty dark plot. <laughs> Great, well, thank you for, that sounds really compelling. Thank you for sharing the, the um, <laughs> our future work. Um, so I suppose that um, those are the ends of my questions. And okay. I'd like to just thank say you. thank you so much for the opportunity to interview you at this. Uh, and thank you for everyone who uh, is putting up with me as an interviewer, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, so I suppose we should move to the questions that are. Sure. So I, um, I'll, I'll um, ask one on behalf of uh, one of the um, posters and it's uh, Joseph Sorensen, who you know, I think. Mm -hmm. And he asks about theories about what may have driven the positive or sympathetic nurturing representations of Yamamba. Were these positive representations found in particular genres or in particular historic periods. Um, so um, where did these nice Yamamba come from? <laughs> yeah, that is okay. I think it's, it's a very comp it's a great question. And I think it's very complicated um, uh, to try to untangle um, it. And I think that Noriko Reader does a really fabulous job of that um, in her introduction. Um, and in her, the, the longer book that she is producing. But one thing that she points out is that the Yamamba, uh, there, there is a theory that the Yamamba was a, 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 de a, a deity, um, a divine. Um, some people equate the Yamamba, for example, with Izanami in the uh, Kojiki. So that some people would suggest Izanami is the original Yamamba. She is, uh, after all, associated with sort of the, the underworld. Um, and it, so Yamamba perhaps was originally a deity who was degraded, uh, sort of in her degraded aspect that you have the male malevolent features. But we know that in a lot of, of um, Shinto kami lore, uh, she, the, the kami represent um, as both malevolent and benevolent. You never know which kami you're going to get, so you have to be careful to treat kami uh, appropriately so that they don't show their malevolent side. As far as I understand, that's how it goes. Um, so there's that aspect that perhaps the Yamamba had already been divine. And we see in the Yamamba... Um, uh, the representation really of nature. And I think this is where we get also this complexity that just as nature is both um, fabulous and fearful, it, just as nature can destroy and also can uh, sustain, so does the Yamamba. So the Yamamba, many would suggest, and, and I think this is really what we see in Zayami's, Yamamba represents the power of nature. And so you have, therefore, the good and the bad. Um, the nurturing element then we see later in the um, Edo period, where the Yamamba is believed to be the mother of the superhuman um, boy child. Kintaro. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, yes, so that those are some of the threads that are uh, entwined in the Yamamba story. Thank you for that question. There was a, a question in the chat um, that Ben Knox uh, asked, and it's, it sort of relates to this a little bit. 
And he asked, um, is the Yamamba a yokai that represents the wellness of nature as well as the beautiful atmosphere of the mountains? Oh, what a beautiful question. Yeah. Um, I, I, yes, Yamamba is a, a yokai. Um, one aspect of yokai is also the belief that things that have lived long lives um, become possessed, right? So the um, tsukumogami, things that uh, are objects that have lasted for a hundred years or so become animated and then um, perhaps are believed to bear grudges against the people who used them and then threw them away. Um, and, and readers suggest a connection also with the woman who lives beyond her prime uh, is something like a uh, tsukomogami, tsukomo uh, sorry. Um, and uh, so in that sense, the, the Yamamba is, is another, that's another aspect of sort of the yokai nature of, of Yamamba. But I just love the way Ben expressed the beauty and power of the Yamamba in nature. And um, I, agree. I have a, a question. Um, so what courses, what university courses do you envision the book being used in? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. All of them. Of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I would hope that it would, it's used in women's studies, J Japanese um, courses. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult because it is this sort of hybrid that uh, I don't know that people in Japanese courses are going to want to read my story about the Blue Ridge Yamamba, <laughs> right? Um, but I think in Japanese courses, um, the interview that uh, Ann Sheriff gives the uh, with the no actors is just really fascinating and would, would enrich a Japanese um, performing arts course or any performing arts course really. And I think that um, folklore courses would benefit from this book. And of course, you're going to use it in your class, right? I, I am, yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a, a student from my class right now, Robert Pritchard, who's asking a question. Okay. Um, he says, earlier you mentioned how Yamamba inspired and continues to inspire female poets and artists. Why do you think Yamamba in particular is such an inspiration compared to other yokai? Yeah, so um, again, I think, I think there's an affinity with the Yamamba. And I should, I should clarify that um, it's, it's not just the women who identify with Yamamba. And I, I shouldn't have made it so exclusive. Um, Zayami, of course, was... Uh, had an affinity with Yamamba. Zayami as an artist, as a marginal, per, a person who was a marginal um, figure in medieval Japan um, on the, the, the fringes of society, even though he was a great artist, he was on the fringes of society. And I think he found in the marginalization of Yamamba uh, a, a figure of affinity. And so I feel that artists and um, artists who through their work somehow stand apart, stand uh, uh, um, outside normalcy, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the rigid strictures of society find in the Yamamba a voice. Uh, women who don't want to be held in check, women who don't want to have to submit to certain aspects of the family system, see in the Yamamba a figure of, of freedom. So, so of, of all the yokai, I think the Yamamba represents these things for that, these groups of people. Good. And there's no other questions yet. Um, I'm not sure um, where we go from here, but... <laughs> Well, good. I really, um, 
appreciate the opportunity to talk about <laughs> this figure that I enjoy so much. And I think in uh, Dr. Miller, in your chapter, you convey a lot of the irreverence of Yamamba, the playfulness also of Yamamba in um, Yamamba-chan in your, um, <laughs> your essay about Yamamba and her troop of uh, admirers. <laughs> well, if you remember, um, the two of us uh, saw one of Yasuko's other performances yes. of Yamamba in Kyoto. And um, I think I got inspiration from that performance yeah. also that, you know, she was able to play with the imagery and um, in some cases eroticize it or yeah. um, upend some of our assumptions. And, and so I think that license to um, do what you want with Yamamba imagery was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. If you hear heavy breathing, that's not me. That's that's not the Yamamba that's either. That's the doggy. It's my dog, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we, um, we could, um, if there's, I don't see any more questions at the bottom and we uh, could always end a little early. I think, um, oh wait, there is one more question. Katie, do you want to read this one? Sure. Um, but from Heather? Yes, okay. So Heather says, thank you. I look forward to reading and learning more in Utamaro and his five women directed by Mizoguchi uh, in 1946, there's a scene of Utamaro drawing his Yamauba in Kintoki on the back of a courtesan. I wasn't sure what to make of this choice considering how many erotic works he had. Why did Mizoguchi have him put this image on her back? Um, so um, in this scene, he is uh, drawing an image on the back of the courtesan I believe so. I haven't okay. seen it. So. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a connection. There, Yamamba has gone through many different eras of development. And in the Edo period, Yamamba moved. The, the um, portrayal of the Yamamba was not limited to the no stage. So in the Edo period, the Yamamba was portrayed uh, in Kabuki, on the Kabuki stage. And in the, when that happened, then the Yamamba becomes associated with a courtesan. Um, and the courtesan is uh, forced to leave. I don't know the story very well, but she is sort of chased into the mountains where she gives birth to this um, Kintoki, the super, this super baby, um, superhero. And this courtesan is associated then with the Yamamba. Uh, and is believed to become a Yamamba. So women who are sort of exiled from their safety, from the security of, of their home, um, of where they're um, working, such as in a, um, the courtesan's house, then become affiliated with this wild unabandoned. And so this courtesan becomes affiliated with the Yamamba. And the performances of Yamamba on the Kabuki stage then are much more erotic than you would see on the no stage, of course. And th that's only fitting because that the Kabuki had this alliance with uh, eroticism. So I think that's probably why you see that scene in the um, movie that you depict. I have to look at it, that movie. <laughs> Me too. It sounds very interesting. Um, I see another question from Anthony. Um, Anthony says, has there been any deviation from the historical notion of the Yamamba to, in modern times, to quote unquote, fit it into current culture or, in, or entertainment? I also have this question. <laughs> you what? You have this question? I, yeah, I, I'm curious about if, I, because I've seen, um, personally, I'm not sure if Anthony is thinking this as well, but Personally, I, I think of um, the depiction of Oni or um, uh, different uh, like figures like that, yokai in popular entertainment, like video games or anime or something like that. Um, so I'm not sure if you have seen uh, that kind of thing in current culture and entertainment of Yamaoba or Yamba, <laughs> Yamamba. Now I'm slipping into um, 
territory that I am very not very comfortable with. And I know that uh, Dr. Miller has more experience with more contemporary culture. And she's also written about the, the um, ganguro, the street fashion girls. And I mean, that's as far as I get into contemporary culture. But I know that there's lots of video games um, about Izanami and they turn her into a much more evil kind of character than she is in Kojiki. I don't know if that's the case with, with Yamamba. And maybe Anthony has more information about how she's depicted in contemporary um, popular culture. Is she more evil? Or is it more one dimensional or more binary? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let, yeah. um, I, sorry, we have another question. Should we okay. move on? Yeah. So um, this is from Ron Way. Uh, it's Yamamba is an interesting figure with conflicting characteristics. My impression of Yamamba is more like a benevolent and mysterious recluse. Why do you think there exists very conflicting and even contradictory images of the Yamamba? <laughs> and how do you imagine Yamamba will guard or punish human beings in the 22nd century? Um, well, she can punish them how we want her to. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, can, we, we, we can write the 21st century Yamamba um, uh, as a, a punisher of those who who um, defile the environment, right? A Yamamba is nature. And again, I think that's what leads to the conflicting images of the Yamamba. In, in an er earlier essay, I, I wrote about the way images of demonic women were used as warnings to good girls. Mm -hmm. and, and if you are a, a young woman in the village, probably it would be very fearful to be threatened with ostracization, to be threatened with being expelled into the mountains. Um, and even more feel fearful would be to be told that if you don't get married, if you don't um, obey your mother-in-law, if you don't do these things, you will turn into this vile figure of an old mountain hag that nobody loves. Um, so I think the misogyny that we see in depictions of the Yamamba are, have also been there as a form of um, control <laughs> uh, and warning to women who aspire to step beyond the boundaries of the village and what that represents. So that's one reason I see some of the, the, um, the negative aspects of the Yamamba. Yeah. So I hope that answered Ran's question. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate these questions are so thoughtful. And uh, earlier, Katie asked if there was going to be a Yamamba number two book. <laughs> and with all these thoughtful questions, I'm thinking, yeah, I guess we need to we need to keep writing the Yamamba. Um, or I, I hope that I hope that this um, what Dr. Miller described as discipline smashing kind of approach will take take on um, and that others will try this kind of approach, uh, a, a wedding of academic writing and creative writing. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to seeing how this book is received. Yeah. Because I think we're, we are at a place in academic publishing that I think is really scary for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, publishers are looking for books like this. They're looking for books that are uh, a little more daring, a little more readable, have less academic jargon in them, 
that can reach to a broader audience and different kinds of student populations. So I, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, re great reviews of, of uh, In Search of the Yamamba. And, you know, I think, um, I think it's going to give other scholars um, permission to let themselves also become more creative in their, their work. I hope so. I hope so. I think it, it's, it's, um, it's rewarding, it's nurturing, it, it's empowering to tap into your creative side. And thank you, Dr. Miller, for getting it all started with your art studio. <laughs> well, I think um, I, I wasn't expecting you to talk about that so much, but thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, I think this is a good uh, place to end, yeah. end the event. And thank you so much, Dr. Copeland is, and, and Katie. I think um, all of us have learned something and it's really quite interesting for us, even if we're not taking a class on yokai or something, it's really interesting to learn all of these intersections of uh, historical representation and uh, modern things. Um, and um, th there is a notice on uh, the bottom of the screen or whatever mm -hmm. that this event is recorded and people can see it on the um, Global UMSL YouTube channel if they missed it or if they wanna tell people about it. So I think um, with that, we are ready to end the event. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>